Hello, I'm John Thine and Peter Haley. Hello. Hi. We're directors in the forensic uh, section of uh, Vincent's. Um, today we're talking about uh, business valuations in the current economic climate and just what we're seeing of late because we're actually finding there are quite a few different things that are cropping up. The things we want to talk about today are the current economic climate, what is value, the definition of market value and goodwill, just quickly looking through some of the valuation methodologies, more importantly getting um, and having a look at um, some examples of what we're seeing out there. And if we have time we'll have a quick overview of some of the sort of pitfalls we're seeing out there at the moment as well. And some value drivers, but I don't think we can, that might be a bit ambitious for today. So, firstly, the um, current economic climate. Okay, so sort of some of the things we've seen in recent times are, and that are affecting valuations right across the, uh, the spectrum are the end of the mining boom and just how that's um, flowed through. So, it's obviously not just uh, directly the, the businesses that um, consult to the mining industry directly, but it's also then a flow on as um, people who were in the mining industry have uh, left that and you know, for example things like earth movers and whatever, um, I did a valuation of an earth moving group up in Rockhampton in central Queensland recently where they basically hadn't had any work for about six to nine months. They'd never done any work with the mining industry but what had happened was all the, um, the people who had suddenly weren't getting employed by the mining industry and had come back into the civil construction you know, subdivisions, those sort of things, roadworks, all that sort of bread and butter earth moving, and um, completely undercut the, the guys who'd stayed in the industry. So it's not just the people who were working for the miners, it also affects, it's got a knock on effect. Um, a lot of construction at the moment, certainly in the southeast corners, riding on residential units, and um, you know, what's the, is there going to be a glut of? Um, apartments in the uh, next 12 to 18 months. Um, consensus seems to be there will be. I think we're still seeing quite a few restrictions on finance, so it probably it seems to be a, a, a sort of an increase in the restrictions that are coming through as well. Yeah, to some. Um, so certainly um, we do quite a few valuations for, uh, we're on a lot of bank panels and do a lot of um, finance application type valuations for businesses and franchise groups. Yeah, and things like you know, from a bit of an extreme example, but um, you know, the banks just don't lend on 7-Elevens anymore after all the, uh, the kerfuffle with their uh, underpaying and, and whatever, and just uh, I think they just got a bit scared about whether the profitability numbers everyone was looking at, were they real? And certainly when we did valuations of 7-Elevens, we factored in an arm's length, you know, um, wages, cost, where we saw many instances where the wages were, were well understated what they should be, given you know that the shop is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you need at least one person there every you know, at any time and two people sometimes. So it's pretty easy to work out what the minimum wages should be, and a lot of those um, 7-Elevens that were being sold didn't even have that, so that was evidence of underspending. Um, governments, probably not quite so much in Queensland, but certainly New South Wales and Victoria are looking at increasing infrastructure spending, which will hopefully um, be a bit of a boost to the economy. Then just the general economic outlook in general, which I think is probably a bit, you know, while it's not overly pessimistic, it's not overly optimistic either. It's really flat. Flat, yeah. Um, and something we are seeing, I should have said, with the end of the mining boom is, yeah, there's, there's little pockets of the economy that are still going great. and Things like anything to do with mining, which is one of our examples a bit later, are um, not going so great. And then there's a lot in between who are still just, you know, chugging along reasonably steadily. Um, uh, other things we're seeing in the current environment, customers defaulting and reduced trading credits. And I'll talk about some of those issues in a second. Um, when I say questionable political environment, well, you know, things tend to go a bit on hold while there's a federal election to be held next month. And then the question is, you know, will we get a, um, a hung Senate again, or will you have a federal government who's able to put its agenda through without too much uh, trouble? And, and then, uh, then we'll have a, a short break and then there'll be a state election. State election, yeah, there's always some election on the horizon, isn't there? Um, and lastly, we've got there is digital disruption, which sort of leads on to um, how is that affected 
the valuation of business at the moment. And I think the digital disruption thing is, is a big one. And one way of explaining that is you know, just the way things are changing a lot more quickly in business than, than previously. But we can still go back to this thing called Porter's Five Forces of, of a Competitive Position, which has been around for 30 years or so, this theory. I, I, and, and Peter's going to go and explain how this sort of effect comes into play here. But that this digital disruption, it, um, you, you would have, most of you would have actually read a fair bit on this. Sort of, it seems to be the, sort of the, the flavour of the month is digital disruption. Where, where they're coming from is the, you know, um, we used to have Borders bookstores, now we've got Amazon. We used to have um, uh, video stores, now everything comes through on, on internet. Um, uh, wherever there's an opportunity for technology to, to come into play, or for someone to actually just um, change the way a product is delivered, um, we, we've got to be aware of that, and we're seeing that um, coming in substantially with what we're what we're looking at in, in business at the moment. Um, people are actually, is there a better way? Is there a way to streamline what's being provided? Um, we're seeing there's a big change, particularly um, in the, most of so in the business of delivery of professional services. What we are sort of notice, noticing is the um, the general outlook is that there is less appreciation of the process being done and they're wanting the actual product. So how much does a, a tax return cost? They don't care what actually goes through preparing the tax return, they just want the tax return, how much that is. So I want something for 500, well if someone will do it for $400. And, and I mean that's even flowing through to valuations as well, it's becoming a product that, and I think we're certainly seeing that not necessarily you know, people who engage us are, are shopping on price. Um, and we read an article the other day that the um, uh, over in the states, one of the large law firms over there, has just commissioned a artificial intelligence robot um, and trained it up to be a lawyer. And that that robot has just passed the bar exam over there with no no. Um, it was just the stock standard bar exam, um, and it's just highlighting that anything that is process driven is looking to actually be taken over by uh, more efficient means of doing it. And computers are a big part of that. Of that uh, that future. Yeah. So, so just these are things you've got to consider in any you know, valuing any business, and, and certainly we do. You know, things that we're certainly seeing it affecting a lot more businesses. Some of these things, like new market entrants, as John was just talking about. You know, the whole people, the new market entrants are often coming up with a totally new way of doing business that's on a much lower cost model, and maybe it's digitally delivered, for example. Supplier power. Well, that's another thing that seems to be. Uh, suppliers are dictating terms to the to their to their customers in terms of you know you will pay us within 14 days or, or, or whatever. Um, competitive rivalry. Well, again, that's you know digital disruption. So you got the number and size of firms coming in, industry sizes and trends, and you know differentiation between the old and the new. I guess that it's you've got the um, there you've got basically both ends of the spectrum with competitors. You've got the big end of town. You've got the the category killers that come through. You've got the Coles, Woolworths, Audi. Um, you've got West Farmers. You've got those bigger groups coming through. Um, so from the big end of town, things are being whacked around, and then from the smaller end of town, you're seeing anyone who can actually get involved and actually do something at a low overhead structure is coming in on a price basis. Um, so competitive side of it. If there's if there's money in an area, if there's a niche, you're going to get tackled in it. But of course, yeah, your rivals might not necessarily always. They'll come charging you to town, things like masters, you know, and then go away a few years later with their tail between their legs. So um, not all not all rivals are necessarily successful. Then you've got things like buyer power, you know, where if if you've got um, you know your customers are in the position where they can dictate to you. Um, and is that, is that the case in the valuation, in the business you're trying to value at the moment? It's not a factor. The easy one there to look at is the, the current dairy industry. For um, a while now, Coles and Woolworths have been bringing in the, the cup price um, milk and has been dictating prices. And now it's gone that far that the whole dairy industry is on its ear. Mm. Um, and lastly, yeah, is more the digital disruption thing, the product and technology change, where you've just got fundamental changes in, in how things are being created and delivered. Um, and even distributed, and um, yeah, it just leads on to things like fashions and trends. That's always there, and legislative effects there as well. And if you look at, um, let's take the industry as an example. We've got the uh, tax office looking to drop IRA returns. We've got um, a lot of people now offshoring and, and getting far 
uh, more competitive um, costings to their staffing as a result can reduce reduce um, prices. We've got um, computer innovation, software innovations that um, the accounting software is now becoming um, intuitive in that it actually is just downloading directly from banks and actually cutting out middlemen. Um, we've got customers who, um, I said before, aren't aren't appreciating the process, just want the product at a price. Um, so from that, I mean, our industry in itself is, is, is very typical of what's happening out there in, in industry, um, that we need to look forward and we need to make changes. And that's where, um, again, we're about to go on to looking at sort of what is value. Um, value is all about the future, it's not about the past. And we need to make sure that um, uh, we keep up with that. Or if the businesses we're looking at don't keep up with it, they've got a life. And something else, I mean, just not mean to harp on about the accounting industry, but it's also an industry that's typified by a lot of small players and typically, and financial planners are in the same boat, and I think several other professional services are in the same boat, and a very ageing um, population of participants at the moment and young people not wanting to come in. So how does that affect evaluation also where you've got no succession plan? Um, and that's something that's not up there on the, it's obviously not force of competitive, but it's, a, it's something that needs to be taken into account in evaluation. We'll talk about market value in a while, so you know, ultimately the value is what you can sell it for. So if you've got you know, fewer and fewer compared to historically, fewer potential purchases for your business, how does that affect you? It's interesting, uh, you know, last year QUT, um, as I understand it, at the end of the year there were 81 students who hadn't actually found a job. Now most of those jobs are actually allocated usually in about um, April or May of the year before, um, or, the, or that year, sorry. Um, so if you haven't got so a job in the accounting, by, in accounting yeah, industry, yeah. Um, so if you haven't actually gained a job by the end, where are those jobs going? We've currently got through, I think it's QUT, I think statistic I heard the other day, there's 800 students going through um, doing the law um, in each of the years. Uh, where are those jobs going when the actual industry is contracting? Um, which means are the people coming in now going to be enrolling in these industries. Um, again, it's something to actually think about when we're actually looking forward for these um, professional services. So is there more than one value? Let's get back to a little bit of theory. Um, we often get asked, as I'm sure you do, as to can you value this? But the question is, well, how are you valuing it? Um, there are some examples of types of values that might be there. Value, market value, fair market value, fair value, which again is different, True value, which is a commercial litigation term, intrinsic value, underlying value, replacement value. Some more interesting ones, um, going concern or liquidation basis, auction value, and then a couple of special ones down the end there, special purpose value or value to party. What's the purpose of the valuation? What are you trying to achieve? What is the expectation of the output that's there? Um, is the uh, approach appropriate given the actual where that business is, is currently in its um, life cycle? The definition, which um, I'm sure most of you have seen, the price negotiated in open and unrestricted market between knowledgeable, willing, but not anxious buyer and seller um, at the arm's length. Now, if you don't have one of those um, categories, you technically don't have market value. So if one of the actual parties is, you know, the, the seller is being pushed to sell or the buyer is anxious to buy or they're, they're known, um, or in a market that there's no actual buyers um, out there, so and what, you, what you actually offer is what you'll actually get the business for. Is that market value? So particularly when looking at comparable sales, is it appropriate to do so? One of the important things about um, business valuations is that um, it's all about the future. So the second arm of the, uh, the valuation is that the amount of prudent investors are prepared to pay in order to receive the future um, uh, earnings having regard to the risk. So it's all about what is the future earnings based on the level of risk associated with that business. Um, and those two things are, I think are quite often missed in, in business valuations where uh, we see a lot of valuations where they've just been you know, looked at the historical three years, done various adjustments and we come up with a value associated with that. And there hasn't been enough actually emphasis on where is the business in its current life cycle, where are the risks and opportunities and where is it going in its business. Goodwill, um, what is goodwill? There's a big expectation that, that goodwill out there is all about its reputation, it's all about um, it's been around for a long time, great client base, it, it's, um, people think that the business is good, it's got a great product. That's not what um, commercial goodwill is. 
Commercial goodwill is all about the future profits over and above a benchmark return for the assets employed. So the first thing you need out of a business is a return on your infrastructure, and then over that you need a profit that you actually start paying for. Um, but it is all about future profits. So you might have all those factors there, those dot points at the bottom, reputation, etc. But unless they convert into profits, and, and as John said, a return over and above a benchmark, then you won't end up with commercial goodwill in a, in a valuation sense. Okay, so um, just quickly going through some of the, the more common methodologies when you do try to value. So none of this has changed. The current economic environment doesn't change how you do evaluation. That's really what we're, we're uh, trying to emphasize here. So you've still got earnings-based methodologies where you look at you know, what um, what is this business producing by way of profits um, compared to an asset-based methodology, which is normally the minimum value is you know, what are the actual hard assets under it. And then you've got other methodologies, rules of thumb, market-based valuations. So the most common one in the past has been capitalization of earnings, where you work out the earnings. For example, we might have determined that future earnings are $100,000. You then have to determine a capitalization rate, which essentially is the risk rate. So in this case, in this example, we're saying 33%. So when you think about it, I mean, you can get 3% you know, in the bank. So a typical small business, 33% um, is not unusual. So the risks involved in a small business are substantially more than sticking your money in the bank. So you capitalize that, three, which equates to multiplying by three. Now, some people think that means you're saying the business is worth three years profit. You're not. You're saying, I think I need a 33% return on this. It just The answer comes out to the same as three years profit. So NTBA we've got there is the net tangible business assets. So that would be things like stock, debtors, creditors. So in this example, we're assuming they're about 200,000. Therefore, in this example, we've got goodwill of $100,000 because our, our total return divided by our risk rate is greater than the tangible assets employed in the business. Um, conversely, same risk rate, same business, but now the earnings are only $50,000. We've still got $200,000 with stock, debtors, creditors, etc. But because our, our value based on our earnings is less than those assets employed, we're not getting a return above the benchmark. So therefore, we've got no goodwill. And in theory, you'd say, well, a rational person should sell, just sell up all the stock and collect the debtors, etc., and pocket the 200000 because they're only getting they're getting a $50,000 return on a $200,000 invested in hard assets, which is only a 25% return. That's not an appropriate rate of return for the risk involved in this business. And, and as I said, theoretically. So in that case, the business would be equal, the value of the business would be equal to the net tangible assets. Which leads us on to, we want to talk, a couple of, um, talk about a couple of war stories. What we're finding in, in a lot of the valuations we're doing at the moment is that the traditional approaches, although they, the theory behind them is still very relevant um, and still very appropriate, we need to actually look from a commercial viewpoint as to what's appropriate in the marketplace. So the first example we'll look at here, a business involved in the construction industry, um, essentially it was um, uh, making um, uh, mobile, um, mobile campsites, essentially, mobile accommodation for um, the mining industry. Based South East Queensland, but basically um, has built across Australia. Um, very, very profitable in the, in the um, historical times, but more of late, given what happened in the mining industry, the, um, the contracts have all dried up. Um, now, the, the business is currently is making losses, and the owner has to actually, is contemplating, where to from here? Um, so we've just got a quick example. Um, turnover 2014, 25 mil, with profit of 4.8 million. 2015, um, turnover of 30 mil, with profit of 6.2 million. Um, and the year to date, so the eight months, 1.5 million in turnover and almost half a million dollars loss. So the business is basically completely turned around and it's based on the um, lack of sales. Um, now the business had quite a big infrastructure, it's been able to sort of uh, rationalise that to a certain extent. Um, now the net assets of the business have dropped, um, which we'll go through again just shortly. 
I mean, this is a this is a, a graphic example of how a business can suddenly just you know fall off a cliff almost. But it's it's obviously mining industry related. But um, I mean, one factor I probably didn't uh, mention earlier was you know the effect of things like cheap Chinese imports and so on. I had to value a, few, a couple of years ago a um, a business that made camper trailers, and it had a similar, not quite the same dollars. You could probably divide by ten in terms of turnover and whatever, but it certainly went from you know a three million dollar turnover to almost nothing in the space of twelve months, purely by the fact that there was a huge flood of, of Chinese camper trailers that were selling. You could buy a Chinese one for three thousand dollars. He was selling his for six thousand. His were ten times as good. They'd last much longer. But most people who were buying a camper trailer were using it twice a year, and they thought if they if it'll see you know till the kids grow up, they'll just take it to the tip and dump it. You know, it's three grand they burnt. And again, it's moving into that. Um, they're not. The, the, there is a, a movement in, in customers that they're moving away from what's the process, what's the quality, to what's the price. Um, so in this case here, we've got a business that's had highly successful in the past, and it's, and in a very short period of time has has completely tripped up. <laughs> so what's the appropriate valuation methodology? More importantly, is it a going concern, or, or does it, should it actually be looking at a or do we wind up to actually Move into a liquidation. Um, a bit more background on the business. The again highly profitable in the past. Changed completely where we are now. It was a trust operation, so all the profits have been sort of distributed um, over the years, and it's sort of reflected in more of the, the loan accounts. Um, in this case, here was corporate beneficiary. Um, we've got a situation where he's currently made half a million dollars loss. Can it turn the business around? So what they're trying to do at the moment. Is come up with a strategy to turn this business around, and they and they believe they've come up with a. Uh, it's interesting. People talks about camper trailers, um, in in coming up with a low cost camper trailer type product that with you know where they're aiming it for is um, high volume, a low cost products, and actually start returning this this business firstly to a break even point, and secondly to a more profitable point. But for the time being, until the mining industry um, kicks off again. Um, not actually returning to any substantial level of profit, but to keep the infrastructure in place to survive long enough to actually return return to the mining industry in time. In this case here, we looked at two scenarios. The first was a going concern basis, and the second was an orderly wind up. So the easier one was to actually look at the orderly wind up. What would they actually achieve from the um, the business uh, should we actually wind it up? Now, probably a, a, I've, I've missed one step here. Does this business have goodwill? And remembering back to the um, definition of goodwill, it's all about the future profits over and above benchmark return. In this case here, we have a business that's making losses. We have no contracts for the future and no expectation in the short term for any contracts into the future. Um, this business had a fantastic past, but if you bought this business, you, you cannot expect, unless you completely change its focus in the short term, any sort of future profits. So from that point of view, the process obviously was longer than that, but we came to the conclusion that it didn't have a level of goodwill. Now, we were sitting here 12 months ago, it might have been a completely different story, although I, I would hope that the value of 12 months ago would have been asking questions such as, you know, where, what are your forward contracts like, and maybe all this falling off the cliff would have been foreseen to some extent. So the first thing, have we got a going concern, which is fundamental in any business valuation? If we assume at the moment that it doesn't have contracts, it doesn't have um, a level of profitability, um, this business is not self-supporting, apart from it had millions of dollars sitting in the bank account. Um, but a rational person, if there's no future profits, why don't we just wind it up today? So we did the scenario that we did not orderly wind up. In that case, there we came up with about just under $2.3 million in turnover, or in, in value from its net assets. And in doing that, you've got to look at things like, you know, well, the plant equipment might have a book value of whatever, but will you actually get that value for it? You've just got to consider every item on the balance sheet and say, right, if I'm going to stop this business, um, the two scenarios there are going to concern, which probably means that, you know, it'll be an orderly wind up, so maybe it'll take you three to six months to wind this thing up. The other one is, is a. Um, more extreme is is where you have a, a fire sale where you know if I've got to sell it tomorrow, well maybe I'll only get you know, half as much for it. If I, if I can wait for a buyer to come along, hopefully I'll get a much better price. And I just don't need to make an apology for um, my my staff member who helped me with this slide. 
Um, in both these scenarios, we come up with a zero value. However, the, because we're using a corporate beneficiary, the value is actually sitting in the current liability being a loan account. Um, so in this case here, we came up with it's able to repay $2.1 million back to its um, uh, corporate beneficiary. Um, so the alternative scenario we looked at was the going concern scenario. Now under the going concern scenario, we're assuming this thing's going to pick up again. However, under, under that scenario, if we're going to actually have to, to get to that point where we're profitable and moving forward, we need to fund the losses. That's what we had to do here. We, we went through the, the scenario, how long is it going to take to return this to a profitable position? Um, and I think in this scenario here, we started off with about a $5,000 loss per, per working day. And that was basically um, prorated down to a profitable position within a sort of six month period. Um, we did a present valuation calculation of the um, of the actual losses in this case here, basically just such a short period of time where we're not going to bother dis discounting because it's a rough calculation anyway. And we came up with um, the present value of those losses being just under $400,000. Um, then in actually doing the valuation, we actually brought that in as one of the liabilities um, of the business. Um, and in that scenario, we actually got a greater return um, to the to the um, uh, the shareholders if it was actually done on a going concern scenario. So in that case, what we're trying to highlight is although the fundamental assumptions or the fundamental um, methodologies are correct, we need to actually, in some cases, um, be very commercial and open-minded about how we apply those in practice because they're, we're, we're coming across some really interesting um, outlooks for business. The past is not necessarily a good indicator of the future. Um, so we need to actually be quite um, uh, open-eyed when we look at our approaches. Which sort of leads us on to the second example where we had an advertising agency that had pretty well built up over the last 10 years, but it had always started from this one main client and then built some other clients around it. And to the extent where they, um, the main client was 40% of their income, however that client had, had recently told them they were more than likely to move that what the advertising agency was doing in-house. So essentially what they were doing was all their um, social media advertising. You know, when you're, you're on Facebook and an ad pops up to the side of you, it's how they get into all that. So they're going, they realised they were paying these blokes quite a lot of money and they could probably do it cheaper if they moved it in-house. And that also had a bit of bad luck where a couple of clients that were each, you know, four or five percent had also left in the last six months. So potentially 50% of their total customer base was about to disappear. Hey, they had disappeared or was about to disappear. So on that, um, again, I've just done a very short form um, to fit it on the slide. The difference between 30 June 15 results on the left-hand side there, that's what they actually achieved. And 14 and 13 weren't much different. So if you, if you just went to the um, sort of the lazy school of valuations and said, oh, I'll just take the last three years and average it, you'd end up with a number, something like that, where you'd say the profit of this, this business was at $900,000. Now, the capitalization rate's 30%. Now, arguably, that could have been a little higher given the reliance on one customer. But to come up with a value of something like about $3 million. But knowing that we were likely to lose 50% of our client income, which obviously had the effect on the on their income dropping by 50%. Unfortunately, our, our expenses don't also drop by 50%. Now, doing the calculation, I think what we actually assumed was you know things like wages would maybe drop 20%. You could get rid of some staff, but there was certainly a certain level of staff, and and the people you had to keep to service the the continuing clients were you know the higher skilled people who are more expensive. So in terms of um, people on seats, I think we were projecting we could have gone close to losing almost half our staff, but in terms of our wages bill, it wasn't going to be anything like our total cost. And then there's only a few other things that were probably like, so things like rent wouldn't change. Um, and a lot of your other expenses are reasonably fixed. So expenses weren't going to drop to nearly the same extent as what revenue was. So how will this business look going forward? Um, good news, I suppose, is it would still be profitable. With uh, but our profits have dropped by about eight hundred thousand dollars from nine hundred and twenty-nine to one hundred and twenty-five thousand, and our total value 
has dropped from about three million to four hundred thousand. So this was actually um, similarly to how I haven't got a slide for this, but similarly to how John in the previous business also factored in that there would be you know, losses to be incurred over the next six months that we had to fund to take off. In this case, it was sort of the opposite. We, in valuing this one, we assumed that that customer, the big 40% customer, would stay there for about a year. So in doing the valuation, we said, long term, we think this is a business that has earnings of about 125000 a year, and it's probably worth 417000 but on top of that, you'll also have the next 12 months, you'll still have that big customer and you'll still have your profit from that. So in terms of valuing this business, it wasn't just a straight earnings divided by cap rate equals value. You had to also add, um, it was almost like a, a surplus asset being the profit you'll generate in the next 12 months from that 40% customer. So. Just very quickly then, because I appreciate we're starting to run out of time, um, and those examples were the main thing we wanted to bring out of today's session anyway, in terms of how you just, you know, you just, you start at the basics and think what are, you know, the methodologies are still the same, but sometimes you've got to think a little bit outside the square in terms of, well, there's major factors affecting these businesses, how do I account for that in the valuation? So some common things in valuation pitfalls, and there's some, um, what is being valued. And, and understanding what is being valued. Um, uh, so from that point of view, um, talking about the, you know, the business as an entity, um, but in, in looking at the actual business, understanding what's the dynamics around that business and what needs to be taken into account. Yep. And that's, that's the main thing, the dynamics of that business. The so second thing in calculation of the future maintainable earnings, that second example I just had, as I said, if you just looked at um, 13, 14, 15 results, you'd say this is a business making almost a million dollars a year. You know, but the question is what's it going to do into the future? Calculation of the capitalization rate, discount rate. Historically, most mum and dad type businesses that are producing something generic sell for around three to four times their EBIT. Um, now, whether you're doing it for a bank, whether it's EBITDA, whatever it might be, there, there are all sort of variations of that. However, going forward, I think we're going to see there's going to be a lot of um, changes to that. There's going to be, it's going to come down to what's being valued and what's the outlook for that type of business given the actual um, changes in environment, and one of those being digital disruption uh, moving forward. So keep your eyes open. And I think that's certainly personally I've, I've started to increase the capitalization rate, the risk rates I've been applying in businesses because those two examples are just things that, you know, 12 months ago you might not have necessarily seen those coming and you would have severely overvalued the business. And so I think there's just this risk of digital disruption or whatever that, that's more relevant today than five or ten years ago. And I think that's that's probably, I think the loyalty in business is starting to disappear a little bit. I mean, historically, if we saw a, you know, a, a business has, has worked with a customer um, under an operating agreement for the last five to ten years. Which was our second example there, that 40% that customer, they've been servicing them and servicing them well for the for 10, 12 years. So the expectation is, well, you're right, we don't have a contract moving forward, but why would that change? And I think what's happening in practice in a lot of cases is that the reason that will change are actually reducing their levels of profit and they're trying to actually say, well, how do I actually maintain our profitability level? What can we do? Well, you know what, those guys are great guys, but we can actually get it we can do it more profitably this way, so let's change. And we are seeing those sort of changes coming through. So again, the past is not the future. Um, what does capitalised value represent? Um, that's just a little quick one. Quite often we see the capitalised value being put in as the goodwill. The capitalised value is not necessarily the goodwill. The capitalised value is the value of the business, including the goodwill, but also the business assets and liabilities. Um. Another pitfall is you know, in calculating the tangible assets that are used in the business. So if you go back to the first example there, you know, the stock might be on the balance sheet at 250000 but if we've got a business that's questionable as a going concern, are we going to get $250,000 for that, for that stock? And you just need to question every, what is the true value in the particular, you know, if it's a going concern, the two hundred fifty might be fine because we'll sell that stock in the ordinary course of business and recover our two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. No worries. If we've got a business that's potentially got a few problems, uh, 
might have to clear some stock to help cash flow or might even shut up shop, then what is that stock worth? And you just got to, you know, it's a case by case basis. You just got to look at every everything um, and question everything. And that's from that's from every single item. If you look at say stock, you may only get sort of sixty to seventy percent of stock, but included in that, you'd also have to pay ten percent seller's fee. And the plant and equipment, the same deal. You may only get the sort of um, sixty seventy percent of value or book value, um, but again, you've got to pay that ten um, percent seller's fee. So when you actually work out all of those little bits on the way through. Plus, actually, the cost of winding up, um, retrenching staff, paying out entitlements, um, paying back the bank, um, breaking agreements, paying out leases for lease for, um, uh, for lease premises. The actual net value can actually be substantially, materially below where you think it might be. That last one is is probably the one of the most important ones, which is really where we start and finish. Is the valuation result reasonable? Well, is the valuation methodology reasonable? Is it going to actually take into account all the risks that are that are apparent? In the valuation that you're doing, and finally, is the valuation result reasonable? Will someone pay that? Would you pay that for this business, given what the risks you know are there, and, and potential other risks? That you know, that's the whole thing. I mean, no one knows the risk. You don't know what you don't know, do you? So, um, what we do know is things are changing, and certainly, yeah, these are, these are factors that you know, I've been doing valuations pretty well full time for the last 15 years, and 15 years ago, we just didn't see this same sort of change. As quickly and businesses being as affected as quickly. Sure, you'd see the odd business that, like that second one, had a, had a you know one customer who represented half their earnings, and you knew if that customer something happened to that customer, that business was going to be in trouble. But there just seems to be so many more businesses being affected by stuff that the the owners didn't see 12 months ago or six months ago, and they're just coming out of left field and, and hitting these businesses. Yeah, you know, even things like if you're running an accommodation house and you know. Most of your income these days is driven by Expedia or Booking.com or, or one of those search engines, and you lose your 10 percent or 12 percent off the top to them, and that's a cost you didn't have five years ago. So just things like that that are always changing. So that's about as much we'll get through today. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to um, contact Peter Haley or myself, John Thine, um, and um, further that we'll uh, we'll talk to you on the next uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you.